Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Colonis, and I'm the director here at the Fort Lee Library. Um, I thank you for coming in from the nice weather outside to help us celebrate National Poetry Month. This is a really special event for us. Um, the library is a lover of poetry <laughs> as a whole, and I just want to announce that we run a monthly poetry uh, discussion group, and it's run by a local resident, Sarah Hallman, who is here today. Um, there's no required reading. She brings the poetry to the meeting. Um, she does lovely readings, and then they have a very intense discussion. So our next one is Wednesday, May 25th at, um, at 2 p.m., and we'll be running those through the summer. So I hope you can come. Um, did you know that there is a poetry press called Cabin Carry Press here, right in Fort Lee on Horizon Road, who has been in existence for 22 years, and we are so happy to have them join us today for this special reading. As a not-for-profit literary press serving art and community, Cabin Carry is committed to expanding the reach of poetry and other fine literature to a general readership by publishing works that explore the emotional and psychological landscape of everyday life, and to bring that art to the underserved where they live, work, and receive services. Founded in 2000 by Joan Cusack Candler and Florence Eisman, Cabin Carey began the aim to demystify poetry. The idea has grown, and the press has continued to bring poetry to people where they live, work, and receive services. We also have um, a table in the back on your way out with some items to check out. Um, they're published by Cabin Carry Press, and there's also some items for sale if you'd like to own one of those wonderful titles. Um, we also have our friends of the library who are sitting right outside the door. If no one is a member, you may want to join. Um, they're also having a special event on May 15th. Um, record columnist Bill Ervolino, who's hilarious for those of you who have seen him, will be doing a special event. And if you're a Friends member, it's a members only event, so you can sign up today and get your tickets for that. Today we have readings from two poets, um, Gabriel Cleveland and Joan Cusack Handler. After they do their readings, we're gonna have some time for a Q&A and we can ask the poets some questions. And you'll have some time to purchase books as well. So first I'm gonna introduce Gabriel, who will be reading first. Um, Gabriel Cleveland is a poet and fiction writer with an MFA in poetry from the Solstice Low Residency Program and is the current managing editor of Cabin Carry Press. Along with Joan Cusack Handler, he co-edited Places We Return, a 20th century, 20th, 20th anniversary retrospective on the publishing history of the press. An avid video gamer, we need to talk, Having some programming there uh, in June, and music lover, he hosts the Andover Special, a weekly internet radio program on homegrownradio.com. Homegrownradionewjersey.com, excuse me. Gabriel is also a mental health advocate, often working online to raise awareness, visibility, and money for psychological and psychosocial issues. He has spent several years in the field of caregiving for people with increased physical and or mental needs and want you to know that you're not alone. I will introduce Joan after the reads. Thank Thanks you so much, Kate. Thank you very much. All right, let's, I'm not gonna use the stand, but we'll see, we'll see. All right, so uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's great to see so many folks in attendance and I've been looking forward to it for a long time. So, I'm gonna read a few of my poems, and then as Chris mentioned, uh, Joan and I uh, put together this wonderful anthology, Places We Return To, a collection of poems from our, uh, at the time, 20 year history, and I'm gonna read some poems from that as well. So, but I'll start with my own, and you know, they say, Got to make a good first impression, so I'll, I'll start with this one. I don't know, it'll, it'll make an impression. We'll see if it makes a good first impression. But it's called, I want to get into your heart, not your pants. I'm not trying to lay you down in an ocean of linen like two submarines converging 
on the geothermal depths. I just want to know how you feel about the open sea. If the endless expanse trembles your skeleton and your nerves flare like you'll surely be devoured. I want to know if you feel the same as me, cumbersome yet insignificant, like a sun-peeled empty shack. I'm not asking you to rattle its walls with me until they collapse. I dream of lining them with artifacts unearthed by exploring the frontier mindscape stretching out from me to you. I don't need you to want to pounce when I pass like a house cat on a quivering vole, nails entrenched in my shoulders, teeth ferocious for my neck. I want to nestle down by your side and learn the meaning behind the subtle sounds of your breathing. And I want you to choose to do the same. Identity poem, take two. <clears throat> little by little, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge gives itself back to ocean storms. Concrete and steel dust blue crabs and oysters in the depths. Some people pay to be driven across, shudder in their own passenger seats. There's harder things to be scared of than a bridge, like seahorses and pine trees. But then there's reflections, each wrinkle a desert road, lost reception, water gone, shadows living in skin, the body's flaps and folds. But how to the body contours like cotton, like bamboo, a fort to climb inside, an unfinished thought, breaking, reforming, cystoid and dense or brittle, uncertain at best. When the sun scatters, it casts orange you could sink your teeth into, titillated blush red, bottomless fleshy purple, blue, a thought that will never end. Together and blinding again by noon, it's a paint and skin peeling white. It draws out sweat like a big test or a bench press. Someone with a slow gait and a wide stance, like he owns the sidewalk, the entire sidewalk. There's room enough in this poem for everyone else or me. Then I have a few that are set in Fort Lee, so you know, look for your uh, your local, uh, you know landmarks, right? Um, this was written five days after I moved here. Um, day five in a new city, Fort Lee, New Jersey. And I walk all the time, so it's referencing that as well. 31 miles on foot or bike, building a map in my head of delicious smelling street corners, personal gardens with flowers I can't identify, but which look like white trumpet bells, 9-11 monuments on the rare slap of green land, which I'm learning isn't as rare as you'd think for a place right across the GWB from NYC, where you can find cliffs the size of high rises and gaze through trees at waves massaging a beach you can't swim in, what with it being the Hudson and all, and who knows what other mysteries. But then, I'm always surprised by Jersey's ability to squeeze nature in with its mass of people who lead small, snowy dogs on every sidewalk and, for the most part, seem like me to be out just for the walk of it. This one is uh, called Perfection Rides a Glass Horse, um, which is really honored to uh, have the opportunity to put together in collaboration with a, an artist as part of the Arts in Common Places program uh, down in Sarasota, Florida. I always say Saratoga because I spent so, so long in uh, northern New York, but Sarasota, Florida. Um, 
So yeah, here's the poem anyway. <clears throat> perfection rides a glass horse. I am in remission from perfectionism, but often think of the crystalline horse I used to ride, traveling far on its back, seeking success and strangers' affirmation. Its legs splintered at a trot, shattered at a canter. Every mistake sent me hurtling to the ground. Still, I lived, envious of scripted, limitless worlds on television and of babies with their rigid, unslouching spines. How I wished to be faultless, that the times I felt the wind in my hair were fleeting as a laugh. There was never enough to feed it without starving my own heart picking myself apart for each and every flaw. So at long last, I've begun, yes, begun, Dad, <laughs> to give it up. Accepting my shortfalls is a vast, uncharted land I traverse on foot, mapping mistakes like rivers, mountainous pain, places I wouldn't have dared explore for fear of failure. In the heat, Scars emerge from hiding, blossom across my skin. On my walks, the smell of lavender drifts from a sprig hanging out of a dumpster. Really, it's the best I can hope for. A couple more. Uh, this one is called Kite. It's one of the most recent ones I've written, so if you hate it, that's why. <laughs> um, about a mile into the Henry Hudson Drive, overlooking the sun-licked George Washington Bridge, there is a kite twisted and snared on an errant branch. For over a year now, I've passed by and watched it fade. Judging by the old Pabst and Corona in the gutter along the sheer rock wall, maybe it's been more of a spectator event than you'd imagine. Or maybe our littering is just more out of hand than I thought, cans cascading all the way up 200 feet of stone. But back to the kite, the way it hangs there, contorted into a submarine's silhouette, weakly tilting from side to side, most of the fight long gone from its frame, marionette of a disinterested twig. If only it could reach those little wooden fingers that hold its fate Surely, it thinks, it would snap them and be free to soar the sky once more. But let's be reasonable now. It is in no shape to fly. It would sink to the ground like I would if I were drowning in the center of the ocean. In a way, this is at least kinder than the dump, a mobile for those who notice a reminder of the strings we cannot see holding us in place. A chance at visitation for the child that lost it to begin with. Watch how it comes to life in the breeze. I haven't dared look. When Fort Lee gusts hit 50 miles an hour, it must think itself released, thunderous in the squall violent with the fearsome energy of something new, a vibrant flash of purple and blue, exuberance so strong its thin skin tears with the wind. I'm not enough of a poet for that raw terror or beauty. Okay, this one, it's a little dated at this point, uh, it's like referring to maybe seven months ago. I'm, I'm getting there, getting uh, better. But it, uh, it's a timestamp. It's called Learning How to Live for Me is Not an Easy Thing to Do. My first full year alone passed like a wisp across the sun, so thin and quick it cast no shadow. My own shadow has shrunken enough that I get compliments on my looks and worry I might disappear completely in a few years' time. I recede into work. I live in the office. 
that's not hyperbole, look up my address. I could pack up and leave in an hour. Again, it's dated, now it's more like two. Um, but I've walked the streets of this town thousands of miles now. I can claim it as my own. I know it like you know your favorite song, and it may be the first new piece of me. The other pieces I'm still gathering. Spices in the kitchen, recipes tweaked to my liking, little by little, my cautious return to writing. My homemade computer, my microphone, my soundboard, my Thursday afternoon time on the air. Just for me, but something I love enough about myself to share with the world. Right. A couple more for real this time. <laughs> the last two. Um, anyone who knows me well enough knows that I'm a little bit of a sucker for uh, for flaming hot Doritos. So this is a confessional poem. Um, Doritos flaming hot nacho, and it has the inscription: "Bet you can't eat just one." They're making money on that bet. Um, like the old Lay's bet, the moment a chip touches my lips, I transform to a salt and crunch addict. The savory cheese with its aggressive heat emerging in aftertaste from tortillas, perfectly textured, edges rounded with a thickness designed to crumble at the slightest pressure from my teeth and to drop flavor like a gift onto every scorched taste bud. And I overeat them, which is to say I eat them at all. Nose running, lips tingled, numb, coughing fiery dust from my lungs like a cartoon cheetah, throat clogged with napalm saliva, mouth leaving neon red smears on napkins like tubercular blood. In an hour it stings when I pee, a couple more in my intestines squeeze like a fist. Why do I do this to myself? <laughs> in a decade or two, they'll probably be banned carcinogens for all I know, but for now, I chase their flames with clementine crescents that burst with flavor rendered twice as fitted to my tongue's eager, swollen receptors. I'll embrace a great deal of pain if it tastes good. And sweetness follows. And uh, this one's a long time coming. I think everyone can relate to it after uh, 25 months of the pandemic. It's called Poem to the Hugless. You are missing something crucial. The biceps that blanket your full frame. The fingers that walk along your back to find a place to rest. The forearms that compress against your shoulder blades to pull you close. The warmth of another person's chest against your chest. And how the warmth is beyond simple heat. The warmth is a relaxation in your face and your muscles and a slight smile. The warmth is knowing you are fully embraced, if only for a moment. The warmth that comes when you give another person warmth and the worth of that moment, how the moment can last as long as it's needed and how deeply you feel that need now. I feel that need too, feel it deep in my bones which seem hollow, like I could take flight from this earth and with nothing to hold me, never come down. When this pandemic finally ends, I will stand on a corner giving out hugs like Halloween candy for as long as it takes for anyone who needs it. I'll see you there. So those are mine. Uh, cool, right? Um, going to read a couple. Uh, as you all probably know, Carol Stone was supposed to be here. Um, she was unable to make it. She's okay, but she just couldn't make it out today. So I wanted to read at least one from her poem, uh, 
our collection of poems, American Rhapsody, uh, which we have for sale over there. Uh, it's called By the Light of the Silvery Moon. The chickering piano, the best that rum running money could buy, carved legs, hand painted roses on a yellow background, half covered by a flower fringed shawl my father bought so my mother could pass the evenings alone. War over, stock market up in a speakeasy, high rollers hoisted glasses of single malt. Ten dollars a shot, a month's rent, making whoopee. Piano that holds a photograph of my parents sitting close, that no one plays, that I sat beneath. I want a spoon, learning to tie my shoelaces, listening to the grown ups who never spoke my father's name. It's all about uh, her experiences growing up in. Uh, that era, the late 20s, the 30s, you know, with her father who um, was connected to the speakeasies and all of that. So check it out if, if that caught your attention. Uh, and I'm, I have more bookmarks here than I will possibly have time to read, so just imagine what, what could have been, right? Um, but I'm going to read a few from our anthology because I'm very proud of it. And it has uh, 104 excerpts or poems from our first 20 years of publication. Joan and I worked so hard on it. You wouldn't want to even know. <laughs> Endless. So, all right. Um, this one is called Near Rats and the Devil, and it's by Sherry Fairchalk from her collection, <coughs> The Palace of Ashes. Near Rats and the Devil. The women of Taylor, Pennsylvania watched from windows while their men ran to the last blast of the company's whistle and would step out until the great gates latched shut. Bad luck for a man on his way to the mines to meet a woman. In the dark, near Rats and the Devil, was the men's place. No women went below. They worked under the sun's supervision, flinging corn to geese, pinning up Monday laundry, burying bulbs at the feet of plaster virgins. No woman of Taylor ventured any deeper than her cellar with its shelved jars shining in rows, its slumbering crocks of pickles and sauerkraut Though their men lugged down pails packed by women's hands with whatever simmered on coal stoves the night before. That noon hour whiff of kitchens tasted of the brightness overhead, like the scent of wet lilacs trickling down an air shaft in May. Rats ran to it, too, and ringed each chewing man, their eye glints red as lit cigarettes. Stoned from alleys, poisoned in kitchens, chased by terriers through backyards, rats were friends in the labyrinth under the town. When the Susquehanna flooded tunnels, men followed fleeing rats to dry ground and, ever after, sprang with their picks all company-laid traps. When rats lingered to gnaw at what was dropped, reared to beg crusts, miners knew Timbers propped overhead would hold. When rats ran, you'd better run yourself home. <clears throat> Women were a different matter. Their bedrooms a tunnel, a man entered in fear and wonder beneath a plastic crucifix, but closer to the devil. A dark space he worked at night and crawled from, proud to have done his job, relieved to be out intact, weak, trembling and homeless as an unearthed rat. Mm -hmm. uh, this was called The Alligator's Hum. It's, it comes to you from Kenneth Rosen from his collection, The Origins of Tragedy and Other Poems. The Alligator's Hum. 
to allure an alligator lady so she'll allow him to fertilize her eggs before she buries them in her sand nest. The male alligator hums in a swamp pond like a kid in a bathtub. It hums like a foghorn and raises queer geysers of water by his torso's profound vibrations. These inverted, fragile, almost crystal chandeliers is obligato of amor. I've tried doing this on dates without knowing what I was doing. Mm, my date pretended she didn't know what I was doing either and would ask, are you all right? Mm, I'd echo something below my solar plexus now governing my lowest reptilian ganglion brain. But I swear, like people who claim they can't understand poetry, she knew what it meant for the hum of the body to dominate mind. It meant, please admire my wet inverted chandeliers, which translates like all of poetry too, into alligator. You can get me if you let me, you grinning, beautiful, primordial swamp water creature, you. Then their tails slap the water with a belly womp. They thrash like mad, almost invisible. The human eye is never naked. And then it's over. <laughs> I think I've got time for two more, and I'll pass it to Joan. Um, right, I'm going to read one by our beloved Cat Doty. Uh, this is from her first collection, Momentum. Her second collection uh, just came out last year and just won the Patterson Poetry Prize. We're so proud of that. Um, and it'll be in the library soon for, for checkout as well, so be on the lookout. Uh, but this is from Momentum. For May is the month of our mother, for Rosemary McLaughlin and Laurie Varm. When jump rope smacked the softening tar, we took turns taking Mary home. She was white with a blue screw-off bottom, supplicant hands, and a rosary rattled inside as she swung in our book bags. After supper is good for some, Sister Michael said, or before bed, if you pray the rosary, communism will fall. When my turn alphabetically came for Mary, I rattled her the two blocks up the hill. The Catholic in our family was for kids, and communism was a word, not a stick or stone. My mother was tired. My father was going to hell. I wasn't up to 50 Hail Marys alone, but I couldn't just dump Mary there on my cluttered dresser like a glowing white wimpled bottle of shampoo while I climbed the catalpa tree or played pies with the others. So I set her down on our suitcase-shaped Victrola and put on Mom's pericomo Ave Maria. <laughs> Mary stood on her snake with her begging arms out glowing. The next, the sky in the window grew orange. The breeze carried lilacs. Next, I played Nelson Eddy. Nelson Eddy, Ave Maria. <laughs> Mary, her one inch face held too much sadness to bear. To cheer her up, I played rum and Coca Cola, the Andrews sisters, and our souls were so open from all that Ave Maria that we threw ourselves into the rhythm and jumped on the bed, and I beat Mary like a maraca in my palm, her burden of black beads clacking thick and loud until one slap too many cracked her right in half, and her beads flung themselves to the floor where they lay like intestines. I learned then to use something right. No, I didn't. I learned 12-inch virgin polystyrene luminous ivory black beads and screw-off bottom ran $4.95, or 20 weeks of allowance. I learned, too, that Mary was real to crack like that, and I saved a splinter of her shattered gown, and I know she is patron saint of the spring-cracked mind, 
and mother of all who aspire to glow in the dark. This is probably as good a time as any to note that uh, Joan and I did an interview uh, this spring for the Presence Journal of Catholic Poetry. Um, so if that suits your fancy, check that out. Um, it's a good interview, if I do say so myself. So, uh, last poem, this is one that's near and dear to both our hearts and everyone at Cabin Carey. Um, it's by the late Jack Weiler, the late great Jack Weiler, uh, Hoboken native, um, native or just became Hoboken native. Yeah. Yeah. He lived and breathed Hoboken is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, this is the title of a poem from his second collection, his final collection, Davina is Davina. <clears throat> My beloved had a friend. My beloved is Johanna. Her friend is Davina. Of course, my beloved's real name is Marco, and her friend's real name is Hector. My beloved brought Davina to my home. She spoke no English. I spoke no Spanish. Well, of course, I spoke a little Spanish, and Davina tried a little English. My beloved and I have two dogs. Davina loved our dogs and took them out. When she came to visit, she would stand outside and cry, Johanna! And inside, the dogs would cry. My beloved's friend, Davina, died. Not suddenly, not prettily, not like anyone should die. She died in a hospital in the city of New York, and no one knew her name. She was Hector Gomez. She had no family. She lay quiet and still and faded into the world. No one in the hospital knew Davina. If we had stood outside and shouted her name, they would have walked us to the side and asked us to leave. They wouldn't have been jumping up with joy to hear our cry like my dogs, like Johanna, like me. So my beloved's friend met her end alone in a city hospital with no dogs prancing around her, no flowers blooming, even though it was spring. You could say, and you should. What the fuck is this? You could be angry, and you should. What kind of world tosses humans in the trash? But that would be like asking why the leaves blow in the fall. It would be like asking why flowers wilt in hot sun. It would be like asking why Hector is Divina. Hector is Divina because the flowers bloom. Hector is Divina because the sun rises. <clears throat> Hector is Divina because she is. Because we are. Because the sun is. Because we die. Because. Because. Hector is Divina because we need to hear someone outside our door crying our names. Divina is Divina. Joan Cusack Handler is a poet and memoirist, memoirist, a psychologist in clinical practice, and a blogger for Psychology Today of Art and Science. Her poems have been widely published and have received awards from the Boston Review and five Pushcart nominations. A Bronx native, she has four published books with Cabin Carey, Glorious, 2003, The Red Canoe, Love in Its Making, 2008, Confessions of Joan the Tall, a memoir, 2012, and Orphans, 2016. She currently resides in Brooklyn and the East Hamptons. Joan is married to a great man and fellow psychologist, has a loving son and daughter-in-law, and two amazing granddaughters.
incredible reading um, on every level. You, you lived inside of each of the poems that you read and um, certainly made them alive for me. Um, I'm going to, as he did, start with <coughs> my own poems and then move on to some poems that I selected from the anthology. Is this good? Yeah, that's that's very good. good. Okay, good, great. <laughs> Another language. <laughs> the vibrating floor tells me my husband's back. How clearly bodies speak. The back of the head, the list in a walk, the weight of a sandaled foot at the end of a body of impressive size. Face, voice, no longer needed to announce us. That's marriage. The air we breathe. 42 years of it, trust in each body's statement, plea, innuendo. Moves. One. My hands reach for my husband, his hand hip, sigh. Sometimes they stroke his chest. Though lately, not enough. The aging is hard. Forget to kiss, nestle, squander our bodies, join forces in the kitchen, fingers diving into the red meat. Two. I've taken to grading us again. Nothing intellectual, even practical. Touch, mostly. That act of hands, legs, whole body seeking love is received. The gazebo, small sanctuary this morning, all virtue. Could they be guests clustered on that jetty leading to it? Inside the gazebo, sanctified as chuppah, three people, the couple, the efficient giving counsel, preparing the contract, readying this chapel for its holiest work the sacrament, the joining of lives. <laughs> what could be more sacred than this small cathedral in the form of a cross? The long spine of redwood she'll walk, the broad limbs embracing the couple, and the head, at the head, the chapel itself, Christ, the initiator. No nails here, no thorns, just the master himself, as in Canaan, blessing the wine, feeding his flock, behind him, white caps, rushing to witness. Above the beach, Fastidious as I am with what I consider mine, I redesign everything. On Noyak's back road while Alan drives, I trim tendrils and vines my father worried would choke the trees. Move that pole to the other side and marvel at the golf course halved by the road. No change is needed here. Never touch the sea seldom the beach. Until this morning, 
First to go is this charming gazebo at Redwood Walk, forming the ever-present, everlasting cross. Wherever I go, I find God. Next, the ever-mounting berm that keeps this jaunty sea from having its way. Wave chasing wave and fooled itself, ready for its day on the beach. This sea is mine. Today I'm Christ clear in the temple, but I'll be generous. All worshipers welcome, provided they make no attempt to impose constructions that block my sea. But now, it's just me. Alan prowling the beach, someday our son and his daughters romping at the edge. I'm feeling a little wobbly. I'm going to sit down and read. Sunday, 11 a.m. Low tide. Men in green. Pitchfork seaweed. Berms to protect the beach. Not the green I remember. More brown. Measure of the harsher sun. Today, I resent nothing. Even people don't bother me. I welcome the gazebo, the head of Christ, the jetty, the perennial cross leading to it. Six people walk in formation as if in grief. Where better to face a loss? Rules for the fourth quarter. Turn the other cheek. That's going too far. Try the benefit of a doubt. Assume no evil intention. Try. Celebrate the dogwood, magnolia, and forsythia without the tirade that follows the snowfall that steals them. Answer the phone but not when you're pissed or your heart's breaking. Just say nicely, it's not a good time. Thank everyone. There isn't a person in your life, or for that matter, walking the street, who doesn't deserve at least one thanks weekly, one a day, close friends and family, the breast adjusted for how often you see them. Be generous. Plan a parade of play dates with your grandchildren. Make a commitment. Wild rice and pesto, his favorites. Never run out. Walk one half hour, five days weekly. Get out of bed. Love the gray sky as much as the blue. Cheat less sweetly peanut butter, chocolate, gelato, scones. Stop talking down to your sister. Let the cab driver talk. <laughs> Don't feign sleep. Respond. Dig a hole, plant a tree, lilac for the cousin you no longer love, lilies of the valley for mom. Sing your heart out. Forgive the chihuahua, take leisurely baths, try dancing, get out of bed, stifle your impulse to attack, accuse, say hello to a stranger, do that daily, love, the, love everything, let go of the clan you were born to, forgive them, try, Ignore what's missing with everything, everyone. If only love the world. Keep singing louder, no longer afraid. Give up shame. Find old friends. Start again if they'll have you. Confront envy. Admit it. It's the first step to diffuse it. Relinquish greed. Control yourself. Find ways to pray again, 
other than in crisis. Clean up your room. Give praise, even if the other buys for it. Let them have it. What does it cost you? Try not to be afraid. Flat back. This is an orthopedic term. Then the poem will tell you about that. I miss balance, sure footing, the clipped remark of my boots against the pavement, the straight silhouette in storefront windows. I've lost three inches between my fused spine and stooping, the years plowing me under. Unseemly, yes, but it feels like that sometimes. I want to hike myself up on the side of the pool, not shy away from my neighbor's pickup. I miss my round tush in my Ralph Lauren dress. No way. My butt's never been globe-like. One's in the family. Shovel butt, I'm told. And I miss pretty shoes, black patent pumps, red sandals. They're finally making style in my size. But I turned around and my ankle had to be fused. Arthritis after a break. Not that I don't love my sneakers. Yellow and red, banded with silver. My uniform these days. Sensible, like routine, <coughs> like marriage. I want an affair. Seductive, dazzling stilettos. Forget it. It'd take another surgery to start straighten those toes in full view in sandals. But black patent pumps, the strength to walk in them, the assured pitch of my back gliding in perfect balance, the long stretch of me strutting that bulkhead, feet slapping the stone. Wombs, too. Another glorious morning, children safe at home tending to each other. Alan languishing in the sun while I'm with the sea, my ever giver. And I'm reminded, if I didn't know how tasty flesh is to our sea brethren, I'd join them. Not now, of course. There's nothing about this day or life that wants it to end. But suppose it had to. Life might be fine inside the sea. The sad ball of him. The sad ball of him out there wrapped in turquoise north face. Not since his body fell the first time did my heart break as it did this afternoon. His slender shoulders, back bent in a tight blue knot on the snow-covered terrace. Then the collapse, rain of tears, chest heaving torment, caves in to the bottomless, bottomless muck of heartbreak. No. Not muck, endless. The bookcase. Empty now, the corner I designed for myself, my books, hundreds, now a fraction of them, comes with age. The stripping down, parsing small parcels of joy as we enter this next stage of less. Fewer rooms, clothes, friends, issues. For those of us who live by them, books, leather bound, lin linen, some pristine, others tattered, most read, all savored, adored. My Tolstoy, Chekhov, Dostoevsky, Steinbeck, Maugham, Hemingway, Carver, several of each, all distilled wisdom, all one needs. These 50 will do me for the rest of my time. 
the ones I have to read over and over till the dirt takes me. Enough humanity to remind me daily who I am, who my dark neighbor is. How sparse the wisdom in these others. They care not for summation, condensation, most just beautiful words in lines and phrases. Oh, the heaven of language, the retreat from the world to God's natural gifts, so abundant, so healing, so intoxicating. But for me at this stage, these 50 are Bible and script, telling me, teaching me what it is to be here. And I will Right, two more. Waters, what separates this gulf from the oceans I venerate? This one's beach, laugh out loud hanging out, all of us under our umbrellas like the Long Island Sound I grew up on. My spot at the edge of the bulkhead, cracked cement and towel, my lounge, scores of us, Head to head, sunning, baking, radios blasting, Chuck Berry or the platters, and I just another kid, finally fitting in, grateful for the last few minutes before getting myself ready for the scarfed corners of 68B. Tiny, five tiny rooms, six huge people. And I will finish with this one. Life's promises of sun, chance of rain. My relationship with my husband. The ease of 42 years, sunny mostly. We've reached that stage where fighting's rare. Side by side, speaking love in all its gestures. Him searching out my perfect spot where it's only me, a few gulls and the sea such gentle language. And tomorrow there'll be another perfect spot and another the day after. Then me sauteing onions to top his steak or salmon, freezing buckets of wild rice and pesto so we never run out. But we did. These last weeks when poems were the only love I had time for. But I'm back and so is he. I think I'll close this notebook for a while. Thank you very much. From Casimir Square by Karen Chase. The Swim. Still she has her silent say. I swam nude in a creek with my mother once. We kept a distance. Then she said how nice I looked. Sun on her dark hair, wet curls on her neck. She painted cadmium red canvases. My flesh cushions my bones. When will we ever get over her drawn out death? The creek has filled with thawed snow. Her lilies are beginning to bloom. The sky now is begging for notice. Rattle by Eloise Bruce. That's the book. The Solid Body. June spreads like butter. I am a white smudge in its heat. I know this melody and the cricket's music, their back legs moving so fast. I sometimes fall or fly or am transported by tornadoes in my, my dreams. I am 10. I am chubby. 
and I am running my feet and his pound over the, and I, and I am running my feet and his pound over the hard red clay. I jump the sky into the blackberries in three long leaps. The briars and his belt lash me. He is slow because of the drink. He carries me through the long rows of pecan trees. I lie so still after doing the daddy dance. Against which by Ross Day, that's the title of the book. Pulled over in Short Hills, New Jersey, 8 a.m. It's the shivering. When rage grows hot as an army of red ants and forces the mind to quiet the body, the quakes emerge, sometimes just the knees, but at worst through the hips, chest, neck, until like a virus slipping inside the lungs and pulse, every ounce of strength tapped to squeeze words from my taut lips, his eyes scanning my car's insides, my eyes, my license, and as I answer the questions three, four, five times, my jaw tight as a vice, his hands massaging the gun butt, I imagine things I don't want to. Imagine things I don't want to, and ins inside beg this to end before the shiver catches my hands, and he sees me, and something happens. This poem is from Through a Gate of Trees um, by Susan Jackson. The man who couldn't talk about the war. He grabs her arm, seizing her from sleep at 3 a.m. Don't move! There's someone here next to us. She looks into the darkness, then again to his face, filled now with transparency, carried back to the jungle, to the ambush. Her eyes search the vacancy of moonlight on the window. It's a dream, she tells him. We're all right back to sleep. He sinks back to silent breathing until suddenly he flings his arm across her shoulder. Stay where you are, he shouts. This place is full of mines. Help them. Help them. But she cannot see the bodies or hear the sounds they make. She lies in the narrowness of one side of the bed, touching his hand until light seeps through the window, across the contour of the no one who is there. Waking, he reaches for her, and turning to him, she thinks of the things that can be shared. A table, a bed. This next poem is from Southern Comfort by Nin Andrews. Bathing in your brother's <clears throat> bathwater. Bathing, Miss D'Angelo informed us in health class, is very important, especially once you become a teenager. In fact, I can smell many of you this very day. So I advise every one of you girls to go home and take a good long bath tonight. I know some of your folks like to skimp on water, but consider it homework. Say Mr. D'Angelo assigned it to you. But girls, let me warn you, never take a bath in the same water as your teenage brother did. Why? Well. Picture this, all those tiny bubbles settling on your legs when you sit in a nice tub of water. If you could count every itty bitty bubble, that would be only a fraction of how many sperm stream from a single man. Even if he doesn't touch himself, the water does. And it only takes one, 
one fast-moving, whip-tailed sperm. And you know how easy it is to catch a cold? How quickly that little virus races clear through you? And once that happens, no one will believe you're any Virgin Mary, no matter what you say. This is from Walking with Ruskin by Robert Cording. Without end. Because she gave him life, she must bury her dead child inside herself. A labor without end, but one she undertakes. Because she gave him life once, she must do it again, one cell at a time, if necessary. Limb buds, pits where his blue eyes will be, caverns and ridges to reveal a brain and heart, his neck and face, and after those first signs of wrists and ankles, his five webbed fingers and toes. Her child will not toss or turn or kick for more space as he once did. He will not be reborn. She knows this, but because she gave him life, her child must be carried with her. There is no other way for the full term of her remaining life. And I'm going to end on a sobering poem. Uh, from the book Rewilding by January Gill O'Neill. Hoodie. A gray hoodie will not protect my son from rain, from the New England cold. I see the partial eclipse of his face as his head sinks into the half dark and shades his eyes. Even in our quiet suburb with its unlocked doors, I fear for his safety. The darkest child on our street in the empire of locks. Sometimes I don't know who he is anymore, traveling the back roads between boy and man. He strides a deep stride, pounds a basketball into wet pavement. Will he take his shot or is he waiting for the open mouthed orange rim to take a chance on him. I sing his name to the night, ask for safe passage from this borrowed body into the next, and wonder who would mistake him for anything but good. since the pandemic started so that tells you something because I'm used to writing like more than 50 a year and I've written like 10 since 2020 so hey you know make of it as you will right I, I like them so that's more important sometimes right quality over quantity but uh, definitely you know the pandemic is such an assault on the senses you know it's such a emotional and spiritual drain it takes every ounce of you sometimes to get up and get out the door and remember that the world is still out there and all that is the work of poetry as well but when there's such a threat <laughs> sometimes you 
prioritize the living and, and you know the poems will come when they come. I actually did not write a poem during the pandemic. Um, and I actually just recently wrote two poems, which are the first in years. What I did during the pandemic was uh, write a memoir. I, my sister died during the, the pandemic, not from COVID, but from um, a heart attack. And, um, and I was going through my own, um, you know, uh, challenge of aging and taking care of my body and, um, and, you know, coming to grips with the fact that, you know, there isn't any time left, or there's very little time left. Um, so I wrote about that. And, and I did, that, that took me um, out of COVID and, um, and actually it brought me out of the depression that I went into um, at the beginning of it. So. <coughs> Um, thank, you. thank you very much. I, I have some comments on both of your poems, but on the question that Chris just said, I actually felt closer to poetry during the pandemic because I was very alone and there were a lot of poems that came back to me and, and then, wow, Emily Dickinson was one of them. Um, I just, and um, I actually used a lot of that time to really get you know, deep inside myself even though I was you know, lonely like everybody else. Um, and Joan, um, I found some of your poems alluded to death in a nice way, um, talking about going into the sea, the poem about death and sea, but you alluded to you weren't ready for death yet, if I got that right. Mm -hmm. and so I thought, that, oh, yeah. I, I thought that was very good, that today wasn't the day you were going to die. No way. And then your poem about losing friends reminded me of Elizabeth Bishop's poem about loss. You know, so that, um, um, and then I also liked in Gazebo where you wrote, Everywhere I go, I find God. So that's good. Thank you. Um, and I always have something to say. So, Gabe, I loved your poem. I loved your poem about the kite. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And talking about Fort Lee, so at one point where I walk in the morning, there was this kite that was stuck in the tree for so long. I wanted to climb up and get it. And I loved your line that said, um, oh, where was it? About the invisible strings? Yeah, the invisible strings that hold us in place. Yeah, so that's also a metaphor on the way things are in life. There's always invisible strings that hold us together. So I better stop talking, but I, I loved it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Is there anything that you? Oh, we have one here. Here's the tool. If it wasn't for the pandemic, do you think you would be writing about the world outside that we are all experiencing as far as politics and wars that well, seem to have had no, no allusion to that in the past year? The, uh, after. Thank you. The two poems that I just wrote were, um, Gabe mentioned being in, involved with art and commonplaces. And, and so I also was gratified to be included. And um, the, the artist and myself decided on a theme of hope. And I wasn't feeling very hopeful. Um, I've had a very strong reaction 
to Ukraine and to the carnage there. And I wrote about two sides of hope. One is hope and the other is despair. And it was a little too um, dark for us to put on a poster. So I went back and thought about where I feel most hopeful. And that was in my home in the country, um, in the um, with all my trees around me. And, um, and that's what I wrote about. But the, I do believe that I would have taken up the crisis that we're going through now. It's, um, it's impossible to not know it's there. credit I picked up some of the tricks from her uh, from her previous readings um, taking close notes in the audience like ooh inflect more here really you know nail that line so thank you I just want to add I'm so glad we got to do this in person because yeah. I think something just would have been lost if we weren't all in the room together so I'm so thankful that we're doing this, um, yeah. not over Zoom. <laughs> yeah, and this is what the second... And you can feel the energy um, yeah. Yeah. when both of you read yeah. it. It's remarkable. And this is what, like, the second time that uh, we've been in the same place since 2020? Yeah. 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 Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one more? Yeah. Poetry has to be read out loud, and that's what poetry readings are. You have to... The words... Are, that you wrote have certain rhythm to it, a, a dance to it, um, an expression, and when you convey it, we feel it. It's a, it's a, it's a dynamic. It's a two-way street, and that's exactly what a poetry reading is. Thank you. And there's great pleasure in the reading. Yes. Yeah. And sharing the work. Because that's, uh, in my mind, that's that's the um, closing of the gestalt, if you will. The, um, you know, what started one place came all the way around to another, and the final stage is really sharing it with its readers. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for sharing with us today, and I hope to have more future yeah. partnerships. So. That would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the opportunity. It's, absolutely. It's so been great to share with everyone.